All right, folks. So in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about ham radio propagation and specifically the D layer of the ionosphere. Stay tuned and let's check it out. Okay, so the first thing somebody might ask is, what is the D layer? And what it is, is the lowest and the most densely formed layer of the ionosphere. It's only present during the daytime, and it is really reliant on solar activity to create ionized uh, or charged particles. Now, some people say, well, why is it called the D layer? And the reason it's called the D layer is they didn't want to call it A, B, or C in the event that the folks who discovered this thing would find another layer. So they started with the D and worked their way up. Uh, just a little interesting tidbit of ham radio potpourri. So the D layer tends to absorb lower frequencies and will limit their ability to take advantage of skyway propagation. And this is why we call like 20 meters, 15 meters, 10, 12, the daytime ham bands and call things like 30, 40, 30 is kind of on the edge, uh, 40, 60, 80, uh, we call those nighttime bands. So let's take a little look at what we mean when we talk about skyway propagation. So what we have here is a diagram I put together using my art skills. And you can see two operators on a depiction of the earth. And what we have is an angle that is going from the left side to the right side. It goes up and hits the ionosphere where it refracts down and comes back down at the same angle at which it hit the ionosphere. And this is called your incident angle. We're going to refer back to this conversation a couple of times as we progress through this video. Now you have other things like ground wave propagation. And at the bottom, you can see uh, where we have the skip zone. And this is the skip zone is where... Um, the ground wave uh, propagation has ended and the incident angle hasn't come down. So folks in the skip zone aren't able to hear your signal or report back to you. The distance between the two operators is generally referred to as the skip distance. <clears throat> Here's another picture that I drew. I was going to use crayons, but instead I used Canva. Fantastic application. And what you can see is a depiction here of the different layers of the ionosphere and how they change as we move from left to right or day to night. Uh, now, people will debate and say the D layer starts at 50 kilometers and the F2 layer ends at 500. So trying to get adequate, consistent information on the height of these diff different layers changes quite a bit. But that also speaks to the different layers of the ionosphere and the ionosphere itself being a very dynamic situation. So during the day, we start off at our D layer from about 70 to 90 uh, kilometers. Then we go into the E layer of the ionosphere. This is where things like sporadic E take place. And that is around 90 to 160 kilometers. And then topping it off, like icing on a cake, we have the F1 and F2 layers of the ionosphere. And they span from about 160 kilometers to 400 kilometers. Now, at nighttime, F1 and F2 kind of dissipate a little bit and combine themselves and create a single F layer at the height of 160 to around 400 kilometers. And the E layer remains the same. It's the D layer that actually disappears during the night. And the D layer is kind of what we're talking about in this video, and we're going to get into why, because the D layer really impacts our ability to use skywave propagation. Now, I've shown various variations of this slide in the past, and the reason I do, because it's really important for us to understand um, how the ionosphere impacts HF propagation. And what we have here is conditions in the ionosphere cause radio transmissions to behave differently depending on frequency, ionosphere conditions, and time of day. And there's a couple of things we need to pay attention to as hams, and one that uh, we talk about a lot on this channel is the MUF, or the maximum usable frequency. And so this is the highest frequency that can be used to communicate via skywave propagation at a given time. We talk about the highest frequency. It's generally above 20 meters. And what we have is an example where we say if the MUF is 14.3 megahertz, transmissions made at 28.5 megahertz in the 10 meter band, they're going to penetrate the ionosphere and they're just going to go straight into space. They're not going to refract back down and we're not going to hear those. Another term or concept that I wanted to discuss is called the LUF or the lowest usable frequency. And this is where the D layer comes into play. During the daylight hours, the D layer of the ionosphere absorbs these signals. Um, and it limits our workable bands to the bands between the LUF at our lower level and the MUF at our higher level. And uh, what will happen is, is that anything that is below the LUF is going to get absorbed. Anything that is above the LUF is going to hit the sky, it's going to hit our ionosphere, and it's going to refract down in some form or fashion. Unless it's above the MUF, and then it's going to go out into outer space. 
The one thing is, is that if the luff is higher than the muff, there is generally something crazy going on in the ionosphere and skywave propagation is not uh, possible. So here's where people will say, ape, you're wrong, son. What about NVIS? I can do NVIS at 40 meters during the day all the time. So that's true. And NVIS is skywave propagation, but it's a little bit different. And let's talk about that. So absorption in the D layer is dependent upon frequency and incident angle. We've kind of talked about this a little bit. The steeper the in incident angle, it's the characteristic of NVIS. So NVIS is near vertical incident skywave. So a lot of times when amateur radio operators use a vertical antenna, like a DX Commander, fantastic antenna, they do really good from a long distance or DX standpoint because the takeoff angle of a vertical antenna with an appropriate ground plane is very low to the horizon. And that means that your incident angle off of the ionosphere is very obtuse. Because that incident angle is very obtuse, your skip zone is larger. Think back to the drawing that we took, back, took a look at earlier in the, uh, in the presentation. Now, the tighter your incident angle, the, the closer you get to near vertical incident sky wave, and that's when your signal goes straight up, and then it hits and it comes straight back down, or close to straight up and straight down. NVIS is used for regional or local communications and works really well. <clears throat> now, the D-layer, as we mentioned, is very, um, is very dense. And when we talk about NVIS, the amount of D-layer that our signal needs to go through is less because you're going straight through it. When you go through something on an angle, the diagonal line becomes longer and the chances of your signal bouncing around against some ionized particles, if I can say that right, in the D layer and dissipating is, is greater than if you go vertically. And that's why NVIS is a thing and that's why NVIS works. Let's see if I forgot anything here. Oh, the D layer is most dense at midday because the thing is, is D layer is dense because of the atmosphere. It's lower, there's more air, there's oxygen, nitrogen, all that stuff bouncing around in there. But also during the day, the sun ionizes those particles. When that happens, you have free electrons and those electrons are bouncing around in there as well, creating a more dense layer of ionosphere. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's just talk a little bit about why is it dense? And I think I just covered some of that. There's more atmospheric density. We covered that electron density in all layers varies from day to night. We have more electron density during the day that all dissipates during the night because of the absence of sunlight. Um, electron density is dependent upon solar flux, which is dependent upon the sunspot numbers. We're going to take a look at that in a second. Um, what I want to mention here is the solar cycle is generally an 11 year process and we have good cycles and we have bad cycles and we have peaks in the cycle and we have valleys in the cycle. During a good cycle, at the peak of the cycle, you're going to have more sunspots. The sunspots emit charged particles, those particles come down and they enhance our ionosphere and give us greater radio propagation to a limit. Sometimes you can have too much of a good thing and it becomes bad if you have solar storms and you have solar flares and they can actually cause uh, disruption or instability in the ionosphere. I actually have a video and I'll have it linked below on the solar indices and how to measure sun, sunspot type activity. The other thing that I wanted to mention is, is the Earth's tilted axis and orbit around the sun uh, creates some vari variations in densities. And this can mean different things in different parts of the world. For example, in North America and South America, you may have different atmospheric conditions based off of the axis of the Earth and based off of where we are in terms of our seasons, summer and winter, and in relationship to the sun. Okay, we're going to the next slide. So um, I'm giving some credit to a website, prop.kc2g.com. And if I was you, I would go there and I would check this out. This is a map that is updated constantly on the website, and it shows our MUF, or our maximal usable frequency. And you can see in the light during the day on this, on this map versus the night, you have higher circles with little numbers in them. Each one of those numbers is a representation in megahertz of the maximum usable frequency. So in this particular example, you can see very high maximum usable frequency from the eastern half of North America. So you would be able to operate up to 10 meters in this region, as well as across the pond and into the southern portion of Spain. You also could get down into South America. 
if I wanted to go a little bit further into say like Eastern Europe, for example, I would have to adjust my system, my antenna, my radio and all that other stuff to operate on a little bit lower frequency because the maximum usable frequency there is lower than the maximum usable frequency here. Using tools like this and understanding how the D layer works in different parts of the world will greatly enhance your ability to make contacts, especially long distance contacts. So briefly, we're just going to talk a little bit about the solar indices because I brought them up. And the first one I mentioned was solar flux. And this is your F SFI number. A lot of times you'll hear hams be like, well, I saw the SFI number was 150, which is fantastic. Um, anyhow, these are uh, referred to solar flux units or SFUs. So solar flux index measures a certain number, a certain amount of noise at uh, 2.800 megahertz or 2.8 gigahertz or the 10.7 centimeter band. Now, this can vary between uh, different locations. Now, we have an official recording of this, and it happens at the uh, it happens every day at the Pentagon Radio Observatory in British Columbia, Canada. Sounds like a wonderful place. The higher that we have uh, in terms of SFI, the better. The ranges are typically from 50 to 300. Once you start to get around 120, 125 and higher, that's when you should break out the radio and go have some fun. Now, we talked a little bit about sunspots, and I just wanted to mention that um, you'll see this depicted as SN for the sunspot number. Now, it measures the group of sunspots. Um, it measures sunspot groups and then the number of sunspots. So you might have a single spot on one side of the sun, but then a cluster of three or four smaller ones. And that would give you a solar spot number of four to five, because um, typically that group might be counted as one, and then you might count each one of those individually. Now, as I mentioned, this varies greatly with the 11 year cycle. And generally, the higher number of sunspots, the better. But as you're probably thinking, two small sunspots might not be as good as one big one. So there's a little bit of a fudge factor, as I'll call it, that goes into the sunspot number. <clears throat> and with that, it's going to wrap up the video. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks for watching, everybody. Totally appreciate it.